everybody is a book of blood. Wherever we're opened, we're red. Have you checked the Bienvenidos worldwide fright fans and hellacious hedonistic heathens. I'm Ian Fuego here for the Horror Show and returning once again for the third installment of my monthly series, Bakker at the Moon! Ha 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 ha! Yes indeed Z, very happy to have you here. Hopefully you have checked out the previous two volumes and so this concludes at least a singular chunk of of how these were eventually collected. So yes, the Books of Blood, at least over in the UK, by Clyde Barker, obviously, were put out um, in just singular form. So there was obviously Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. Those were in turn collected and released over here. I don't know if they ever got individual little paperback releases here in the States. I'm sure they possibly did, or there's just been lots of peeps who have imported them over the years, or what have you. But uh, yes, this is at least concluding the first three of the total of six, Books of Blood by Clive. And this continued along with me being just so incredibly impressed with the prose of this gentleman. It's significantly different than uh, Stephen King. As I've said, uh, you know, being the uh, proponent of Hail to Stephen King here for over 300 episodes at this particular point, definitely wanted to start exploring a different author in the scarific genre. And uh, yeah, that was the uh, incepts behind the creation of Barker at the Moon. I'm still debating if I'm going to take a little break and then go to four through six, or maybe I'll segue into, you know, maybe one of his novels like Damnation Game, because I have not really read a lot of Clive. I mean, Scarlet Gospels, but that was specifically because of the fact that there was the, you know, Lord of Illusions and Hellraiser connection. But aside from that, I have not delved into a lot of books that by fright friends of mine have been highly recommended. And so uh, let's get into it. But the one thing that is going to be a little bit different is I have decided to go in uh, bass backwards order, backwards order, <laughs> uh, through these stories specifically because of the fact that uh, my absolute favorite one is the first one that is presented in this volume, and it's the one that I have the most passages marked down that I want to take note of. It's a celebration of cinema. It's a amazing story. One of the best things that I think I've ever read from Clyde Barker. It shows his twistedness. It shows his creativity, and the fact that I'd never read anything like Son of Celluloid before. So I'm going to go in the reverse order this particular time, and I'm going to start out by discussing Human Remains, which I just finished reading and uh, then was you know listening as well and stuff and this story hit me in the feels more so than I was expecting so I don't spoil in these reviews if you're just happening to stumble upon this uh, per se and if so I'm very happy to have you here but uh, this one is without getting into this is really where I wasn't sure the direction the story was going to go. I had some theories, but it's really one of the ones where I have to walk on eggshells the most and just more so express some of the sentiments and the explorations of this particular character, especially early on. So you've got a... Uh, got a, a, a male gigolo prostitute, whatever the hell you want to call him, uh, named Gavin, but uh, he's not, you know, like exclusively gay or whatever, you know, sometimes he'll bed down with closeted men, sometimes it's a lonely widow, I mean, he, he is all about the Skrilla, and he is very much about what he describes as needing a fix of affection. And uh, yeah, so he doesn't pull any punches, but he's 24 and he's been doing it since he was 17. And he also does some additional like hustling and stuff on the side. And so for that reason, he's like, I feel like I'm finally past this. I need to graduate up into, you know, being like full on like gigolo pimp kind of status. And I'm, I'm kind of remembering or if uh, he's just going to decide to marry one of those aforementioned widows or something. But he's been he's been at this game for a while. And you have to imagine that it does take a significant toll. And there is also kind of the, what's the word the, or phrase that I'm looking for? There, there's definitely like a window of opportunity, I would say. And the fact that, you know, it's all about his face and how his face is wonderful and all of that. And so he's like, as I'm aging, that means that I am quickly just getting to that expiration date of opportunity to really make serious money and then I mean, 24, that still seems relatively young to me being in my late 30s at this point, you know, but nonetheless, some of those just inner musings and sentiments from him hit hard 
big time, especially after, you know, being a YouTuber for like, what, nine years now, and to just the, the slog of journalism and the ups and downs and the peaks and valleys of all of that different stuff. And not to say that it like induced significant soul searching, but I could definitely relate, you know, I mean, big time, especially one quote in particular where he's thinking to himself, he was not what he dreamed he'd be or promised his secret self. And youth was yesterday. One of my favorite quotes from this particular story, which once again is called Human Remains. And so he's out one night and he's looking for some business, so to speak. And he meets this older dude who I, I believe is like 50-ish or something, if I remember correctly. And uh, his name is Reynolds. And he goes back to his house with him. But the guy is being like super, super nervous the entire time and giving some major red flags. And he also has like this very posh but very sparse apartment that is littered with all kinds of morbid artwork, you know? Like a decomposed looking body that is almost to the point where you can't even identify its gender and he's got like an ancient tombstone of somebody and then some weird stuff starts to go down after they're having some drinks and there's some noise that is overheard in either like a surrounding apartment, the other room, uh, Gavin doesn't know but that's because he's been drinking vodka and water so he's, he's not super sure and uh that's about as far as I can go, and I know they, they delve a little bit further in the synopsis, but he, he ends up having it out with Reynolds a little bit, and there's like some blood in a confrontation, but not directly involving the both of them. So there's something very mysterious afoot, and he is asked by uh, this older dude, he's like, no sex, just leave, I'm fine, whatever, and to just hurries him out, but is very vague. And after that, all of these like kind of street savvy and like sort of, you know, other creatures of the night, so to speak, uh, start coming after him and saying, you messed somebody up, Gavin, and we're here to beat the shit out of you. We're going to mess up your pretty face because then you won't be able to make as much money, you piece of shit. You know, and he's like, I didn't do anything. I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. And that's where the mystery starts to unravel specifically about a certain uh, piece of art from uh, Reynolds' house that was seen in a bathtub. And this is my second favorite of the collection. I thought it kept me guessing until, I mean, I do feel like it ended a little bit, little bit weaker than I was hoping for. It kind of, it, it built up a bunch of momentum and then it just kind of petered off a little bit. That would probably be one of my only criticisms, but the fact that it didn't have the element of predictability of a couple of the other stories, which I'm about to be much more brief with my discussion about, but Human Remains, I thought was rad and I could relate to it a little bit specifically. And uh, yeah, I, I just appreciated the hell out of it. So props to Clive for, I think probably putting a little bit of himself into this, especially, you know, there's others where I don't really see much of a semblance of his personal self, or at least what I understand about, you know, him as a gay man. But this one, I, I definitely feel like he was delving at least a little bit into maybe some personal experience one way or the other, uh, you know, depending on which side of the coin, so to speak. And uh, yeah, it was great. I really, really dug it. And now we venture into the stories that I'm a little bit less about. So the next one up going in that uh, reverse order that I mentioned is called Scapegoats. And it's the shortest of all of the tales. I think it's only like 24 pages, but it does have a major essence of just kind of yawning predictability. Uh, the setup is at least initially interesting because you've got this group of friends uh, that, that you can kind of tell that some of them don't know each other as well, maybe, especially with some very brief sex that goes down with two of the characters. But uh, they find themselves on this island, but it's seriously like a half mile, you know, and like side to side. And they're just kind of eh, taking their time, chilling there. It's not even on the map, so to speak. But then you've got this guy, I believe his name is Dre, and he's kind of the captain type, so to speak, but he's at least uh, the older and more knowledgeable of this particular group. And he divulges that uh, there are, are p potentially a bunch of bodies that have been buried in this area, and that this island may actually be just like a big massive grave with a bunch of rocks on top of it. And so once you, and, and this, I, I definitely don't think that is like a super, super spoiler because that one is at least mentioned in most of the synopsis. And it doesn't really pan out exactly the way that I was expecting, but characters do die, craziness does ensue. And this is one where I did want to refer to a specific passage. I'm just trying to jump to it really, really quickly because uh, with the uh, character's certain demise and everything, there is a peering into the mind near the end of this that 
I really, really appreciated, and sorry guys, thank you for bearing with, but it's, it's legitimately at the very end of the tale, and I can't divulge specifically who it is, but I thought this passage was particularly moving and strange, and coming from the perspective of somebody who is no longer in the land of the living, but still occupying a space where there could be other living people, time had no place here. The days may have passed in the weeks, I couldn't know. The keels of boats glided over, and maybe we looked up from our rock hovels on occasion and watched them pass. A ringed finger was trailed in the water. A splashless puddle clove the sky. A fishing line trailed a worm. Signs of life. Maybe the same hour as I died, or maybe a year later. The current sniffs me out of my rock and has some mercy. I am twitched from amongst the sea anemones and given to the tide. I have, to, I have to cut off there because it does go into mentioning a specific character, but it does end in a effectively eerie fashion. So I will definitely give Clive credit for that. But the rest of the story, the fact that none of the characters are particularly likable, it is uh, told from a first person perspective of this, uh, this woman narrator. And she's just kind of picking apart the schmuckiness of the people that she's there with. So that's, that's definitely a thing. But yeah, this is one that I, I can't say that I really dug that much. It just, I saw what was coming. It didn't really bring as much of it. The, like the prose, as you just heard, terrific. But as far as the actual plotting, that's where I was just a little bit more on the yawn status of things. So we're one for one so far, guys, and there's still three more to go. And the next one is entitled Confessions of, it's got the funniest title, uh, Confessions of a Pornographer's Shroud. And yet there is, uh, there is emphasis on the pornographer part. And uh, it's, uh, it's because of the fact that this is about an accountant who has no idea about the people he is keeping the books for. And lo and behold, turns out they are peddlers and, and like he's worked for them for like years, if I recall the tale specifically correctly. And he suddenly finds out that they are peddling not just porn, but we're talking like close to eight millimeter sort of shit. You know, I mean, it's as close to snuff sort of stuff as you could think of, like really hardcore bondage, S&M, like Labradors and leather, <laughs> you know, that sort of craziness. And... He freaks out, he has this big moral conniption about it, and uh, yeah, he, after he has his little moment of trying to process all of this, these very seedy mobster sort of people, they beat the shit out of him, and then he goes home, tells his wife that he's been mugged, and uh, doesn't you know mention the specifics because he's just so embarrassed about what he has put his time, and specifically where he has been making his money. And you know what happens? They turn it around on him and leak a story to the press that this guy is the peddler of all of this really hardcore porn. And so it's in the papers. His wife takes the kids and leaves him. It's a very sad, shitty situation. And then he is enraged even more so. But this time, it's like Charles Bronson levels of vengeance that he decides he wants to go about. And yeah, he goes and kills a couple of these guys. And this is... As I said, I'm not trying to super, super spoil, but I have to at least get to the point where he is inevitably captured and tortured and killed because this whole, the title specifically, The Shroud, uh, th boy, this is a really rough one not to divulge some of the later details about. This guy basically, somehow when he's on the, uh, the autopsy table, uh, he puts his spirit into the shroud you know, the cloth that is on top of his body. And then said cloth proceeds to go out and continue extracting said vengeance that was not able to be completed. I know it's trying to be black comedy, okay? I know it's entertaining in that regard, but I, I just really struggled to get over the silliness of the concept in a lot of ways. And uh, yeah, that's about where I was at with Confessions of a <laughs> Pornographer's Shroud. What a title. Uh, funny, I, it was one that, uh, it's, it's one of the shorter ones. It's only like 31 pages, but I don't know. I did find the silliness of the situation where they're like talking about a clan member and it looks like some, like, I don't know, little daughter of the mobster thinking she sees like a ghost and yeah, it is a ghost. It's a ghost going around. It's 
Yeah, like ghosts with just a sheet on top of them, that is what we're dealing with here. So, also, I'm not always super into, like, the mobster stuff anyway, and so Clyde Barker taking a stab at it and the kind of goofiness of it all. I don't know, this one, too uh, straight, unfortunately, uh, going in this reverse order. That did not work for me the way that I was hoping that they would. However, the next story is probably the most well-known, and it's as badass as uh, anybody who was familiar with the mythology uh, could imagine. So it's called Rawhead Rex, and this is the only one of these uh, five stories that's actually been adapted into something. So I have to consult the notes specifically here for this one, because uh, this was a film by a, uh, I believe, Irish director, if I'm not mistaken, George Pavlo. And so this is a guy that uh, when he was adapting Rawhead Rex literally the next year after uh, this collection came out in the UK, what, uh, August 85? God, I can't remember. I know it was 1995, but uh, I'm assuming that Clive already had some clout, and he definitely did with George because of the fact that they had done a movie just the previous year, which was called Transmutations, if I remember correctly. Uh, it came out here it came out here in the U.S. as Transmutations, but I believe the original title was Underworld. So I have never seen that film. I've heard it's bad. I want to track it down, though. So in 1985, George Pavlou did that film with Clyde Barker. It was an original screenplay that he wrote. And then the following year in 1986, that was where Clive adapted his own short story for Rawhead Rex. So I would really like to do a proper revisiting of the, the Rex film because of the fact that I haven't watched it in a very long time. What I do remember, unfortunately, is the fact that the creature looked very silly, the effects were mm, kind of iffy, and uh, but low budge, so in, in 1986, you know, you, you do what you gotta do, but uh, I know that Clive even disowned it at one particular point, but despite the simplicity of the story, it's still very stellar execution, at least on the printed form, and that's because of the fact that you at least get the inner pathos of this, like, nine-plus-foot I, it's like creature of sorts, like kind of giant human, but it's got the ability to like just chomp on people. And they, I, I, so, okay, there's also some interesting discussion before I forget about uh, just, I guess, gentrification even a little bit in the fact that uh, it's uh, like the story starts out with Clive kind of denouncing the fact that these yuppie ish sort of rich people they want this authentic, like countryside sort of experience and so they're willing to if they can you know get the people of this community to give in and sell like some acres of land to relocate and how kind of the that old worldly charm of this sort of rural area is being lost because of all the people from the city relocating and uh, one of the guys who lives there uh, accidentally while he's doing some yard work unearths the tomb of the raw head rex and this this tale goes all the way back to uh, 1548 from what i was researching and so yeah it's just kind of a folk tale that they used to use to scare kids they talk about you know bloody bones you know bloody bones raw head rex you know tommy Rawhead, and there's various names i guess it probably evolved over the years so to speak so that's where clive derived the inspiration here and in, in the storytelling standpoint, it, despite being relatively simple, it does get into some religious stuff and, you know, delves a little bit into the history of said creature. But the carnage, much more so than in the feature film, is it's much more amped up. And, you know, obviously the short story came before, but if Clive had a movie already getting ready to go right into production that he was scripting, I mean, hey, what have you. But, um... Yeah, once said creature is awakened and it's like wanting to eat children and everything, and of which it does, it bites the head off of this kid, and the father of that kid ends up being one of the major forces, you know, without getting too specific, about uh, a ending that I was surprised about it being a little sunnier, or at least more fulfilling, like, vanquishing of something evil than I was anticipating. And, you know, a lot of the short stories, whether, you know, King or Clive or whoever that I've read, uh, they do tend to have more of the EC Comics, you know, Tales from the Crypt, Twilight Zone, whatever. Like, they go for a twist ending, and they go for a gut punch sort of situation. And this is one, I guess that is kind of a spoiler to say, I was surprised about how it uh, was a little bit more good guys win sort of situation, but a lot of casualties along the way. So uh, I will probably be talking much more extensively about this story 
when we have the opportunity to actually review the Rawhead Rex film. And I know Robert Duell is a big fan of this particular short story and is much more familiarized with it than me. This is my first time reading it, actually. So that will be cool to, uh, yeah, maybe just do a reread of the short and then, uh, you know, reviewing of the film and do just uh, a, a, a difference counter sort of situation. But now we have my favorite story of the uh, third Books of Blood. And as I mentioned earlier, it's called Son of Celluloid, and I love this story. It's slimy, it's strange, it is legit like nothing that I have ever read before, and it's, it's definitely gonna be a tough one not to get super, super spoilery with. But first and foremost, the, the framing of this story, the fact that it's in three different parts, and Clive starts it out, he has part one, the trailer. And then he has part two, the main feature. And then he has part three, I believe it's called the censored scenes. And so this story is 100% in every possible capacity for me, a celebration of cinema. And as somebody who adores more so than anything, the theatrical experience and like an old grimy theater is where the predominance of this story takes place. That's where the main feature is. But so setup wise, you've got a escaped convict who is uh, mortally wounded and uh, he has the cops on his ass after escaping and he's trying to find somewhere to haul up and you know lay low at least for a little bit and he ends up in this small little like storage spacey sort of area but it's really behind the screen of the theater and the other bit is that he had a uh, cancerous tumor like growing in his body. He thought it was just like a weird bellyache or something. But no, there is much more afoot, significant more. And uh, so he ends up dying. And then we fast forward to uh, workers of the theater. So they're getting ready to close up one night. It's like after three in the morning. And then there's two, uh, two patrons left. And so one is a 17 year old girl and she's like, yeah, my boyfriend disappeared and I'm not sure uh, where he is because he said he was going to the bathroom and, you know, I'm not going in the men's bathroom, so, you know, can can we investigate? Like, what the hell sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, a another thing that I have to mention is the dude who, when he is escaping at the very beginning, uh, Barbario, I believe his name is, that he talks at one point about what his idea of God is. And his idea of God, he refers to as Sing Sing for whatever reason. And it's like a heavy set dude, like with dark coffee or something. I don't know. Very, very funny. And just the fact that he's like, yeah, that's the idea of God that I have that would protect, you know, a nasty individual like myself. So, so that's funny. But, uh, okay. Yes, there is a passage in the second paragraph. I should just have this like right here just to be certain about it. But, um, okay. 327. Thanks for bearing with guys. We're losing ratings. We're losing ratings. But it's, yeah, that's right, it's at the very beginning. This is a sentiment from our escaped convict in the first part, and I thought it was great. Life was too long if you were locked away and counting it in seconds. It had only taken him a couple of months to learn that lesson. Life was long and repetitive and debilitating. And if you weren't careful, you were soon thinking it would be better to die than go on existing in the shithole they put you in. Better to string yourself up by your belt in the middle of the night rather than face the tedium of another 24 hours. All 86,400 seconds of it. So when you're like, when you're counting the, the seconds, so to speak, at that particular point, that shows how stir crazy he was and how desperate he was for escape. But little did he know he was going to actually accomplish his escape. But based on other factors that were going on, he doesn't make it. He, he goes down and ends up in that, uh, in that theater. And then the aforementioned 17-year-old uh, with the missing boyfriend, it's very funny how the heavier set girl who works at this particular like grimy, gross old abandoned cinema that nobody even goes to anymore except for, you know, strange avant-garde sort of peeps, I would imagine, because we've got some great theaters here in Arizona that are like that. But the, the theater worker, he was very, she's in her 30s and she's jaded and she's upset about her weight, about the fact that she doesn't have wrists and her just fat hand to fat arm, so to speak. So she's very self-conscious and very degaff about a lot of things, but she looks at this uh, immature and kind of, uh, you know, lights on nobody's home 17 year old and she describes her as smoking a cigarette like an amateur actress who's failed to get the knack of it. It's, it. I don't know, I just found that sort of amusing. But 
Uh, the, as I jump to these last couple passages, and just the celebration of cinema alone, there is a moment where a character says, nobody dies in the movies, Ricky. You can just thread the celluloid up again. And those sort of ideas I, I do find fascinating because it is the immortalizing that you get from, you know, being a star on the silver screen and the coolness of it. And it's why so many aspire and why so many fail because they just want to live forever, you know, in that possibility of their art. And so very cool in that regard. And also <laughs> another one of my favorite lines where a character confronts another one and is like giving the possibility of getting them goodies. And it takes, it takes the form of, uh, well, it at least appears to a character as being uh, Marilyn Monroe. And uh, he thinks to himself, well, fictions are fuckable if you don't want marriage. And I thought that was incredibly amusing as well. And also, as the situation escalates and uh, the aforementioned uh, more heavier set uh, lady uh, who works at the theater, she had a previous situation where she needed to like thwart some robbers or whatever and so she keeps a crowbar around called the motherfucker and I thought that was <laughs> very Samuel L. Jackson of her despite being way before Pulp Fiction but just a couple more passages that I really dug as we're almost at the 30 minute uh, rat and I uh, want to wrap it up but yeah so uh, 340 second paragraph another bit that I really really enjoyed so thanks for all hanging around in this podcast sort of situation but so that cancer gained a sentience from the dead robber or <laughs> dead convict robber, you know, uh, you know, assailant, so to speak. And it like sucked up the energy from the cinema. And in our story here, it has the capability to basically, and you know, that's why the boyfriend is missing of that 17 year old girl. And in the investigation process, it takes us to almost like the, the dude thinks he's tripping on drugs because he was taking pills and stuff. And so he's in a western town suddenly as he goes to find this missing kid. And he's got what appears to be John Wayne talking to him. And it was John Wayne's voice, accurate to the last slurred syllable. And it was just behind him. Ricky couldn't even contemplate turning around. The guy would blow off his head for sure. It was in the voice, that threatful ease that warned him. Ready to draw, so do your worst. The cowboy was armed, and all Ricky had in his hand was his dick, which was no match for a gun, even if he'd been better hung. That is the, the sleaze of Clive Barker that I find so amusing from a humorous standpoint, because, you know, the older guy who runs the theater with the, the, the older woman that I mentioned, he's the one investigating in the men's bathroom, and so he goes in to take a piss, and he's suddenly in the Wild West, and he's there with his dick out, and he has, like, a fake version of John Wayne coming, to to kill him essentially <laughs> and so the, the uh, this is where I, I have to ease back because of the fact that I'm already you know, a little bit further into the main feature so to speak but I, I dug where the story went and how it pushes one character who is relatively complacent early on to really rise to the occasion and then as as that is happening near the end of the tale uh, the last bit that I wanted to read here uh, where the hell is it? Okay, uh, 356. I know I've been, I, like, I purposefully have been sticking to this paperback version because I also have a different copy. And so this one I can mark up and, uh, you know, even underline stuff. I know collectors like me, they, they <laughs> it's blasphemous to do that to a book you spend a ton of money on. But when you get this for like eight bucks, it's, it's fine. So this epitomizes the celebration of just the movie experience so, so very much for me. And I'm getting excited because I think it's badass, but um, I hope it resonates with you because it surely did with me. That's why all those scenes were playing and replaying and playing again in front of her. They were all moments when an audience was magically united with the screen, bleeding through its eyes, looking and looking and looking. She'd done it herself, often. Seen a film and felt it move her so deeply it was almost a physical pain when the end credits roll and the illusion was broken because she felt she'd left something of herself behind, a part of her inner being lost up there amongst her heroes and her heroines. Maybe she had. Maybe the air carried the cargo of her desires and deposited them somewhere intermingled with the cargo of other hearts, all gathering together in some niche. <sighs> it moves me, man. It most definitely does. So. As you guys can tell, Son of Celluloid is awesome in my estimation. It was my favorite of this collection, uh, the volume three of Books of Blood. And although, I, since I'm still like on a wave of high about this story, I read it twice in just the last couple of days, and I had Catherine watch it, or I read it too. So this is one that I would love to watch though. 
is where my brain was going just now. I would love to see an adaptation of this. Like, if I could make this into a short film, unfortunately, when you get to the sentient, cancerous craziness that we have in the third act, that's where it gets to be a little much and where you would definitely need some budget. But yeah, it, it, it gets gooey, guys, and it's great. I love this story, and I've had so much fun doing these first three. Baka at the moons! And uh, yes, obviously, a grande gracias from yours truly. I'm Ian Fuego here, and uh, yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of those social settings and such. And uh, yeah, the liking, the sharing, the subscribing, all of those things are great. And the one other thing I wanted to show off briefly, curious if anybody is aware of this, this is from the first volume of the Book of Blood, but here's a really dope uh, hardcover edition of Midnight Meat Train, and it's got some terrific painted artwork in it. It's got both the original short story and the script. I've tracked this down for like eight bucks. I know it was originally, yeah, the un unsigned gift was, unsigned gift edition was $30. So uh, if you can scour eBay or, uh, you know, Amazon Marketplace, wherever, this is a really, really cool re-release of a very popular story from the first book of Blood. And so, yeah, what do you guys think? If you're tuning into this, would you like a little bit of a segue for Barker at the Moon in this monthly segment into just doing a novel instead? Should I start with Damnation Game? Uh, I, I would definitely be going in published order, so I guess it would have to be Damnation Game relatively familiar with the story, but uh, I've never read it, so that excites me. Or should I continue going volume by volume and skip to the fourth edition of the Books of Blood? Let me know in the comments below, and uh, once again, greatly appreciated, everybody, and uh, yeah, that's going to be the end of the proceedings for today, and so until the Wheel of Cock comes around once more, I still always say it, because of the fact that I think it, uh, it, it the real of Ka, that uh, makes a lot more sense in this particular case with how much I love the Son of Celluloid, but uh, yes, I look forward to having more of of this palaver about the awesome Clyde Barker with y'all sooner rather than later. And until then, remember, Fright fans, to stay scared and read Mr. Barker.